Hi everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about positive externalities and public goods. This is the other side of the coin from negative externalities where we've talked about things like pollution and uh, negative unintended consequences of private choices. Today we're going to be talking about the positive side of things. So um, when a private choice has a positive side effect, we're going to be specifically looking at the example of technology and looking at public health, but there are lots of examples of this everywhere. And then we'll look at the application of public goods. And these are just uh, more examples of market failures. And so we've talked at the very beginning of the semester, and as we've gone through this, we've been talking about markets, perfectly competitive markets, and how markets are a good way of organizing economic activity. This is an example of another market failure, another way that markets don't always organize economic activity perfectly. And so we're going to be talking about a couple of key terms here. We're going to be talking about external benefits, those externalities again, uh, specifically talking about positive externalities. We're going to be talking about something called the free rider problem, which I promise you have experienced at some point in your life. Um, we're going to be talking about intellectual property and intellectual property rights. We'll be talking about qualities of goods, specifically whether goods are excludable or non-excludable, and rivalrous or non-rivalrous. And even though that's some weird terminology, again, you've experienced this, um, so I have some fun examples. Uh, we'll be talking about private benefits, uh, private rates of return, and then this idea of what a public good is and how it compares to a private good. Um, and then we'll talk about social benefits and the social rate of return. And we'll be comparing those private benefits and rates of return to the social benefits and the social rates of return, which is very similar to what we did with negative externalities. Remember, with negative externalities, we talked about private costs and social costs. With positive externalities, we'll be talking about private benefits and social benefits. So it's going to be really similar to the same discussion we had in chapter 12, except looking at the positive side and the benefits instead of the negative side and costs. So we'll be looking in your OpenStax textbook. I've got the slides all loaded up, so let's get started. Okay, here we go. So in this chapter, we're going to be talking about positive externalities, positive side effects to private choices, and an example of a market failure called public goods. So first we'll outline what a positive externality is. We'll talk about why the private sector will tend to underinvest in innovation. Um, and when we're talking about the private sector, we want to remember that what we're thinking about here is not the government. So when we talk about public stuff, we're going to be talking about the government, government investment, government decision making. Um, when we're talking about the private sector, we're going to be talking about private markets. So firms and individual consumers and that kind of thing. And so that first section, when we talk about the private sector under investing in innovation, we're going to be talking about private markets. The next section will be talking about governments, the public sector, and how governments can solve this problem by encouraging innovation and different policies that can be used to that end. And then at the end, towards the end, we'll start talking about public goods. And this is another example of a situation where the private sector might fail. And so we ask the government to step in and sort of correct this market failure. Um, and to start this conversation off, we want to look at an example. So this is the view from NASA's Voyager 1 um, uh, satellite. And Voyager was launched in 1977 by NASA. And the idea was that it was going to go give us beautiful pictures of Jupiter, Saturn, and their moons. Um, what we've seen is that Voyager has managed to collect a lot of data and it's a feat of really impressive technology. If you think about being able to send things into space in the 70s, it's pretty impressive. Um, and so it's a great example of technology. And so the question is, is this kind of work, Voyager and other space exploration, should it be done 
by the private sector or the public sector or a combination. And we're in an interesting time now because we are starting to see the private sector start to engage in space exploration with firms like um, SpaceX and uh, Richard Branson of Virgin um, really doing some of that work. But for a long time, space exploration and a lot of technology was at least partially, if not mostly, subsidized by the government, by the U.S. government. And so that's kind of what we're going to be talking about here is this idea of how the government plays a role in encouraging innovation and the basis for why that's rational. Because Economists really believe that markets can do pretty much everything, but there are going to be some situations where the government can step in and improve a private outcome, and positive externalities and public goods are an example of that. So uh, let's talk about positive externalities and public goods. Um, so the first thing we want to understand is why the private sector is going to tend to underinvest in innovation and, and what that means and how we measure it. And so we want to remember the idea that market competition can provide incentives, and we trust market competition to provide incentives. Um, new innovations and new technology can help firms produce goods more cheaply um, with better technologies and also help us create new products with new characteristics that consumers want. So think about the evolution of the personal computer or phones going from landlines to cell phones and how much evolution has happened in technological advances has happened there. There's definitely a private incentive. But there are some situations where competition can actually discourage new technology, um, especially when there might be a lot of copying. There's an example, if you've ever watched, there's a movie called Tucker, and it's a sort of based on a true story movie about technological advancement in the auto industry in the U.S. And the idea was that the industry was... Um, mainly controlled by a handful of companies that didn't want to innovate because new technology, new advancements would have meant they all would have had to pay for new ideas. And so this new guy, Tucker, decided he wanted to pr uh, produce a car that had all these new advancements and was pushed out of the market because the big industry did not want to have to pay for new technology. Um, so it's really complicated. There's pros and cons. And so we're going to see the private sector not always do a great job of um, producing innovation. When we look at the data, economists have found that original inventors of new technology receive somewhere between one half or one third of the total benefits of their innovation. And other businesses and other firms receive the best, uh, the rest of it. And so if you think about the time and energy it takes to develop new technology or a new idea and then only getting half of the benefits or maybe even a third of the benefits and someone else getting two thirds of the benefit, um, you can see how that might create a disincentive to innovate. It might reduce the probability that you want to innovate into new technology. So uh, what we have to do here is we have to differentiate between private benefits that accrue to the person and social benefits that accrue to society. And so private benefits are the benefits that an individual gets when they consume a good or a service or produce a product or something like that. Social benefits include the private benefits, but they also include external benefits that society enjoys. And so the social benefit is the value of all the positive externalities, as well as the private benefits from new technology or a good you consume or something like that. And so those positive externalities or those external benefits are going to be spillovers that others enjoy. Um, so the example I gave last time when we talked about negative externalities was a neighbor with a beautiful garden. Uh, you get to see their beautiful garden, maybe it increases your property values, but the reason you they did it was not to help you, they did it for themselves. Um, you can think about an example of, um, well, then my favorite example is education. You're getting an education for private reasons, right? You want to learn more, get higher wages, get a better job. Those are private benefits. But there's also an external benefit, society benefits from an educated population. And so the total social benefits include your private benefits of getting an education 
and the additional external benefits that society realizes. And so the total social benefit is both those private benefits and those external benefits added up together. So when we think about development of technology, we can think about the sort of return to uh, an innovation having both a private component and a social component. So think about a drug company borrowing money to um, develop a new drug. And the book has lots of great examples of this, of people who have developed new technologies that had massive repercussions throughout society. Uh, one of the great examples is Alan Turing, who in 1936 really truly developed the first um, computing system and helped to end the war. Um, and it was the framework for all computers today. Um, but he didn't realize the benefits that we're all enjoying. So there were massive social benefits. If you think about how much easy, think about it right now, you are taking this class or watching this video from home instead of sitting in a classroom with me because of computers. And so the social, the external benefits beyond what benefits Alan Turing enjoyed are massive. Um, so if we think of the example of a big drug company planning um, their research and development budget for the next year, Year, um, they might have some sense of the money they'll make. Um, we can show that their demand for financial capital, for money that they want to um, borrow in order to do those research and development investments is going to be a function of the rate of return on those investments. Um, so if the firm is trying to decide how much capital to demand, how much money to borrow, if the rate of return is 8%, the private choice is going to be to borrow, let's say, $30 million, right? That's where their demand curve crosses this rate of return line. But if we think about the social benefits to society of developing a drug that's going to solve some kind of health problem, that's going to have benefits to people beyond just the revenue that the firm earns. And so if we think about it this way, the private benefits are going to be that $30 million, but there's an additional positive externality benefit of another $22 million, leading to a total social benefit of $52 million, which tells us that if we consider the benefits to society of creating a new drug that cures cancer or solves some problem, um, we're going to want that drug company to invest more money than they would if they were making the decision only based on their private benefits. And so this is what we mean when we say that the private sector is going to tend to underinvest in innovation and new technology. Their private benefits are smaller than the total social benefit because they're not going to consider that external value, right? They're going to consider the private benefit, oops, not the external benefit, and not the total social benefit. Does that make sense? Hopefully. So, if the firm could keep the social benefits of the investment from themselves, then they would invest at the proper rate. They would borrow the proper quantity of financial capital and invest $52 million in research and development. But there's no way for them to earn those social benefits. Um, and so unless the government intervenes, we're going to see them under invest in research and development. We're going to see them under demand or not demand enough financial capital. And so that's when we say when we say they're going to be borrowing below the socially optimal level and innovating below the socially optimal level. Um, and so if you want to reference, this is in the book in table 13.1 and uh, figure 13.2. Cool. So what is human capital and why should we invest in human capital? Human capital includes anything that makes individuals more productive. So things like education, training, and experience are all versions of human capital. Um, but education and other kinds of human capital require an upfront cost 
for a future benefit that accrues down the road. If you think about higher education, that's a great version of and a great example of human capital investment. The idea that higher levels of education are going to increase your future productivity means that we're going to expect you to earn higher wages. The more education you have, the higher your wages, the more productive you are. Economists have found there's lots of evidence that the rate of return on a college education for a person in the United States is somewhere between 10 to 15 percent um, in lifetime earnings. Um, and so that would be the private rate of return. That would be that private benefit. So for investing in education, you can expect to get a rate of return of about, you know, 10 to 15 percent. Um, so that's the private benefit of human capital attainment, the private benefit of getting an education. But there's also a social benefit, an external benefit to society. What we tend to see is societies where schooling is more prevalent, where people get more education, are going to have better health care outcomes, lower rates of crime, they're going to tend to have cleaner environments, more stable governments, and they're going to tend towards democracies. And so all of those things don't benefit the individual that much, but they benefit the whole society. And so that's the positive externality effect of education. And so if we want to get those external benefits, we need society to consider the total social benefit of education, of human capital, not just the private benefits. That's why we see so many countries invest in public school, whether it's K through 12, or whether it's state community colleges or state universities or that kind of thing. The idea is that we want to increase that private investment to a higher rate to take into account the positive externality effects. So the appropriate public policy response in the face of some external benefit is to try and create an incentive to increase investment. Whether we're talking about a drug company investing in research and development of new drugs or talking about individuals trying to get them to increase their investment in their education, the role of the government and the role of public policy in the face of a positive externality is to try to increase and incentivize that behavior, get people to do more of it than they would do on their own. Does that make sense? The idea is we want to find a way to internalize this external benefit. Okay? Okay. So here's another example of a positive externality, and this is one of my favorites. Um, especially when I'm physically in the classroom um, because I have a young child and he comes home with germs all the time. And so I do my best to stay healthy. Um, I do it for my own private reasons, right? I don't want to get sick. I don't want to miss work. But if I'm not sick, then I'm also not spreading germs to the people around me. So if I don't get sick, I don't go into a classroom, cough on papers and hand them back to people. And so there's that externality or spillover effect of my health on the people around me. And that's what this is an example of here. This is the market for flu shots with a spillover benefit or a positive externality effect. And the idea here is getting the flu shot reduces the probability that you get the flu and reduces the severity of the flu. There's a private benefit associated with that, right? No one wants to get sick. You benefit by not missing out on work, not missing out on wages, not having to buy cold medicine, maybe not going to the doctor as often. Those are all the private benefits associated with getting a flu shot. That's going to create the market equilibrium here where the so supply curve or the marginal private cost is equal to the market demand curve or the marginal private benefit. So the market price and market equilibrium are right here. But when we think about the benefit of fewer sick people walking around at the grocery store, on public transportation, in classrooms, at work, that has an external benefit, a spillover benefit to the rest of the people around that person. So this market outcome is actually inefficient because it doesn't consider this additional 
external benefit, the total marginal social benefit. And so if we want to consider the marginal social benefit of flu shots, we have to realize that the socially optimal quantity is going to be higher and the socially optimal price then is going to be higher. So to get to that point, we have to incentivize that behavior. We have to make that behavior more attractive, easier to do, which means we want to subsidize it. That's why you see flu shots are usually low cost or free. Um, a lot of universities have flu shot um, fairs or they'll give it away for free. They'll have flu drives and that kind of thing, trying to give people the flu shot. Um, I used to work in the county and because we interacted with the population so much, they would just literally come to work and give us the flu shot uh, to try and make that as attractive as possible. Because the higher the level of flu shot vaccination, the greater the external benefit to all of society. And so we want to get that quantity up to a higher level. Does that make sense? Hopefully. Okay, cool. So, um, the next section we want to talk about is how governments can encourage innovation. So we talked a little bit about this a little second ago when we talked about flu shots having a private benefit and an external benefit leading to a marginal social benefit greater than the private benefit, we see the same thing with technology. And there's a lot of different ways that government policies can increase the incentive to engage in technological innovation. Um, a lot of really common ways are things like guaranteeing intellectual property rights, um, assistance with subsidizing the cost of research and development, and cooperative research ventures between private companies and public universities, so blending private and public money together. So what are these things? What do they actually mean? Uh, the first one you probably have some familiarity with. Intellectual property rights are just laws that limit competition in a market. So patents, trademarks, copyrights, those kinds of things are all intellectual property rights. It's basically saying I have rights to my intellectual property, my idea. So a patent gives the inventor of something the exclusive right to make it, um, use it or sell it for at least a limited time. Um, so you can think about when firms develop new drugs. It usually takes a few years before someone else can make a generic version of that drug. That's an example of a patent. Copyright laws give authors and creators exclusive legal rights to their creative material. When we're talk whether we're talking about literature, music, films, uh, movies, pictures, anything like that. Um, there's a really interesting little paragraph, not even a paragraph, just a handful of sentences in the textbook talking about Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse is an example of copyright. So, you know, there might be knockoff stuff um, like Mickey Mouse spelled without a U or something. But generally, Disney has, the Disney Corporation has rights to any content with Mickey Mouse's image but it's only for a limited period of time. Uh, in 2003, the copyright protection for Mickey Mouse was set to expire, um, but Congress passed a new law, uh, which was called the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, um, which allowed these copyrights to be extended, basically allowing Disney to hold on to that intellectual property right for even longer so that there couldn't be legal knockoffs made. Um, so copyrights kind of protect against that. Um, and what we see is generally these intellectual property rights do help to increase innovation, at least in some of the ways that we can measure it. So here we're looking at patents filed and granted from 1981 to 2012. Um, I don't think that's exactly the right scale. I think that I'm only seeing the 90s and the 2013s up here. But if you look at the number of applications for patents, it's increased substantially over the last uh, 20 years. And that's due in part to uh, the 1998 Copyright Term Extension Act. Um, and the idea there is that the greater the length of your copyright, the greater the value associated with those intellectual property rights. So if you tell me my idea is 
protected from competition for two years, that's different from telling me it's protected for 20 years or 200 years. The longer I have that patent and those intellectual property rights, the longer I can make back the money I invested in my innovation. And that's the whole point behind intellectual property rights is if we can protect people's right to make money off of their idea, we increase the incentive to go after ideas and to invest in research and development. Because the thinking here is that coming up with a new innovation takes a lot of cost, research and development money in the front end, and then you need a certain amount of time to make that money back on the back end. Cool? Cool. So, um, the government can actually engage in direct spending on research and development. So sometimes uh, property rights aren't enough. And so another way that the government can increase innovation and technological advancement is to do direct development and direct spending on research and development. So if the private sector doesn't have enough money or enough incentives to carry out the R&D, then the government can provide direct financial support. Uh, we see this with a lot of the research that happens at public colleges and public universities. We see it when nonprofit research entities use government funds. Uh, we see it through government-run laboratories and sometimes private firms. Um, any of these entities can can always be applying for government grant money, and that's going to help subsidize research and development. Um, we see that with a lot of technology is that it's at least partially subsidized by some kind of science or technology grant from the government. Um, so that's another way that we can see incentives created by the government to try and increase the benefits and the incentive to engage in research and development. Another way to do it is to give firms tax breaks for research and development. So it's kind of the same as subsidizing it. It's just sort of subsidizing it down the road with a reduction in taxes. So the federal government has a policy called the Research and Experimentation Tax Credit. And the idea here is that through this tax credit, you can incentivize firms to engage in more research and development because it's going to reduce their tax burden. And there's evidence of this. There's economic research that finds that each dollar of foregone tax revenue or tax revenue we don't collect from this research and experimentation credit is invested in at about the same rate new research and new development. So we're seeing that tax credit go back into new future research and development. Another way we subsidize research and development is through cooperative research, partnerships between the state and federal government and private entities. So like I said, we have grants from organizations, national and state organizations like the National Institute for Health, the National Academy of Scientists, and the Agricultural and Food Research Initiative. And basically what this does is it creates a partnership between public and private entities through partial funding um, and helps lower the cost of research for the private sector, allowing them to per pursue more innovation and try to find new ideas and do new research. Um, so that's going to help um, incentivize that research that we want to see and get firms to realize not just the private benefits, but maybe assume some of those external benefits too. So, the last thing we want to talk about in this chapter is public goods. What is a public good? So let's take a break here and let me give you a little bit of an example, okay? Okay. <clears throat> so when we talk about public goods, we're going to compare them to private goods, and it's going to be on two dimensions. The first one is excludability, whether or not we can exclude somebody from enjoying that good. So there are goods that are easily excludable and non-excludable. And then the next dimension is rivalrous. Is a good non-rival in consumption or rival in consumption? And I'll give you an example of all of these. So the first one, rival in consumption, basically means that my enjoyment of this good is diminished by someone else's enjoyment of it. Does that make sense? So um, my favorite example actually just happened to me yesterday. 
I was out with a friend sitting on a patio enjoying a beautiful sun and he said, hey, you're soaking up all the sun. Is that real? Was I using up too much sun and reducing his enjoyment of it or was he making a joke? The sun is not rival in consumption. If you compare it to, say, this piece of chocolate I just pulled out of my desk drawer, um, if I eat this piece of chocolate, I ruin your enjoyment of it for the future, right? But if we're thinking about sitting in the sun, it's non-rival in consumption. If I sit outside and you sit outside, my enjoyment of the sunlight does not diminish or even affect your demand on use of the sunlight, unless I stand over you or put an umbrella over you or something. And so rival in consumption is this idea that the use of something is going to harm someone else's use of it. So non-rival might be the sun over here and rival might be candy over here. Can I see that? Kind of. Um, so that's the first dimension. The next dimension is excludability. How easy is it to keep you from consuming this good? Think about, again, the sun versus my chocolate. If I don't want you to have it, I can put it back in my drawer. I can put it in my pocket. I can hide it from you. Um, I keep candy for people all the time, right? If you go to the store, they can stop you from taking it. Is it very easy to stop someone from seeing the sun? No. Think about, there was an episode of The Simpsons a long time ago where um, Mr. Burns, the owner of the power plant, wanted to try and block sun from the city of Springfield to make people use more electricity. That was a pretty intense villainous thing to do, right? It's very costly to exclude someone from the sun. So the sun, put it back over here, is both non-rival in consumption and non-excludable. Whereas candy, it is easy to keep someone from having it, to get, keep it away from someone, right? I can put it in a box, I can put it in another room, I can drive away with it. And my consumption of it inhibits your consumption of it. If I've taken a bite of this candy or eaten the whole thing, there is no way for you to enjoy it. So some goods are both non-rival in consumption and non-excludable. Those are considered public goods, right? Um, a private good is, not, is rival in consumption and excludable. So these are gonna be our private goods over here. And these are gonna be our public goods. Some goods are a little bit more complicated. Um, you can think about a movie theater or a concert at a stadium. It might not be rival in consumption, right? You can have hundreds of people there and it's still enjoyable. It might actually be better if lots of people are there than if it was just you. But they can exclude people from it pretty easily, right? They can lock doors, close a gate, something like that. So it'd be non-rival in consumption, but excludable. That would be a movie theater or a concert. Another great example is Wi-Fi. Think about Wi-Fi. Is it excludable or rival? Well, it depends. If it's password protected, it's excludable. If it's not pass or if it's not password protected, then it's non-excludable. How much data does it have? If it's enough for all of us to watch movies, then it's non-rival. But if it's a really small amount of Wi-Fi, if it's not a lot of um, if there's not a lot of data being transferred, then it might be rival in consumption. If I decide to upload a video or stream something, that might reduce your ability to consume it. Does that make sense? Um, another example of something that's rival and non-excludable would be, um, how about Halloween candy? If you've ever gone out for Halloween and people leave bowls of candy out in front of their door, or if you go to an office and they have a bowl of candy out in front of their office, that's 
rival in consumption because it can get used up, but it's non-excludable because everybody's welcome to it. Does that make sense? So when we think about goods, we want to think about them across these dimensions. And what we're going to be talking about today is instead of what we normally think about, private goods like shoes, cars, food, houses, we're going to be talking about public goods, the sun, the air, a lot of public parks. Um, and so that's what we want to think about when we're talking about public goods. Okay, so let's go back to the slides. Okay, so now that we have a little bit of a sense of what these words mean, let's get back to the slides. Um, so a public good is a good that is non-excludable and non-rival, meaning it's really hard for market producers to price it and sell it to consumers. A good that is excludable and rival, we put in a package, we know how to price it, it's clear and markets allocate them well but goods that are not excludable, it's hard, uh, prohibitively costly, difficult to exclude people from, and non-rival in consumption where we can all use it equally, are not going to be priced very well because markets just don't know how to price them. We can't measure how much you're using of them, um, and we can't stop you from using them if you don't pay for them. And so that's what we call public goods. And because the market doesn't do a good job of pricing them, we tend to see these provided by the government. And here's why. If you can't exclude somebody from using it, then they can use it for free. So think about how most goods work. Think about the last thing you bought or paid for. Um, is it possible that you could have taken it without paying for it? Yes, stealing happens, but some things are easier than others to steal, right? If you want to steal a car, it's going to be pretty hard to sneak away with it. Public goods, because they're non-excludable and non-rival, it would be really easy to not pay for them and use them. And so what we have with public goods is what's called the free rider problem. A free rider is someone who wants to use a public good, but doesn't want to pay for it. And this term comes from the explicit example of somebody getting on a bus or a train without paying a ticket. The idea is if you think about a train, there's lots of cars and it's possible to hide, get in on one door and hide from someone and ride for free. Um, so that problem gives rise to the free rider problem that makes it so hard for markets to price public goods. Um, we can also see the free rider problem come uh, play out in terms of the game theory that we've talked about, uh, the prisoner's dilemma game that we talked about when we talked about oligopoly and monopolistic competition a couple of chapters ago. So that's a great uh, reference. Um, and there's actually an example of it in the textbook with two people trying to decide whether they should pay for something together. Another great example of a free rider problem that you might have experienced is if you've ever been in a group project. Um, the idea is if you've got three or four people in a group project, it's possible for someone to do the least amount of work but get the same grade that you got. They would be then a free rider. They'd be getting that good, that grade, without putting in the cost or the work. So in the case of public goods, what we tend to see is the government does a better job of providing them than markets do. And so the way it works is the government collects taxes from all of us and then pays for these goods with public government spending. And so that's why we call them public goods, because everyone pays for them, whether they use it or not. Um, sometimes there are ways to make people pay for these things indirectly um, or try to make up some revenue in other ways. So things like advertising on public radio or um, asking for donations for public parks or national park campgrounds. Um, and we can also use social pressure and public appeal. So when we have maybe an honor system or something like that, collecting resources for a public good or fundraisers for them. But generally, when we think about public goods, we think that the market can't necessarily provide them well. And so we're going to see a pretty good amount of government intervention, if not full on government provision of those goods. So you can think about roads, you can think about 
public education maybe being a public good. Uh, you can think about public parks. Um, a lot of things that the government, a lot of the role for government, according to economists, is that provision of public goods. There's one other thing that we want to make sure we talk about, and these are the other uh, positive externality uh, problems, but there's one section in here that the book hasn't talked about in these slides, but your book does talk about them in the textbook, which is the problem of common resources. So in this matrix, we have goods that are excludable and non-excludable, rival and non-rival. There are also goods that are rival but non-excludable, and a lot of the environment fits into this. And so these are th problems that are known as, uh, goods that are known as common resources. And so common resources can be things like uh, fisheries, right, where we fish for food. Um, it could be forests. Um, it could be, um, I think the example I gave just a little bit ago was this idea of a dish of candy out in front of a house on Halloween. Um, but the idea is it can be used up, but we can't stop people from enjoying it. So think about that dish on Halloween that somebody leaves out in front of their door. What happens to that bowl? Everybody sees there's a sign on there that says, just take one. But is there an incentive to maybe take more than one? Is there not usually someone who might want to take the whole bowl? That's the basic idea with the tragedy of the commons and with common resources and common good problems. The idea here being that because we can't stop people from using it without paying for it first, there's a sort of competitive rivalrous consumption that leads to people over consuming it. And so in that situation, there is a, a couple of solutions. There can be private agreements, um, but a lot of times what we'll try to do is assign property rights, like fishing licenses or um, permits for forest logging, um, to try and enforce that. Because what we see with these tragedy of the commons problems is we see that there tends to be overuse. Okay? So... The last thing we want to talk about is positive externalities in public health. And this is a great way to wrap up this chapter um, because we can think about advances in public health as being positive externalities and uh, related to the idea of a public good. Public health is a public good, right? Longer life expectancy benefits all of us in a lot of ways. Um, and when we look at that over time, as we've seen economic development and technological growth, we've also seen rising life expectancy expectancy. And it tends to stem from three main factors that are related to this idea of public health, public good, and positive externalities. Uh, the first is general sanitation. So the idea that we can get access to clean water for drinking and cleaning, that we can dispose of waste without um, any transmission of disease efficiently, that's going to have a huge impact on a lot of transmissible diseases, both diseases that are carried in water and diseases that are carried in human waste. The next factor is medical discoveries. From a lot of this technological innovation, we've gotten great tech, uh, medical technology, immunizations, antibiotics, uh, detection, early detection for things like high blood pressure, but also cancer and identification of other illnesses that can be treated and prevented. Um, and that's come from a lot of public money, whether it's government funding specifically, university funded research, or public private partnerships like we've talked about already. That's had a huge effect on um, increasing life expectancy. And then the last thing is changes in public behavior through government health campaigns. So trying to encourage people to behave in more healthy ways has a positive externality. Things like hand washing, food storage protection and preservation, refrigeration, right? Refrigeration is huge for food storage, and that has a lot of positive externality benefit. There are private benefits to the people who invented these technologies and advertise these technologies, but there's also a lot of public benefit too, uh, reducing the incidence of tobacco smoking um, and other risky behaviors like 
tech, uh, the technology that helps prevent transmission of sexually transmitted diseases. Those have all done a great job of helping to increase public health and increase life expectancy. And so this is another way of thinking about this idea of positive externalities. So bringing it all together, we've talked about the Voyager um, and NASA's space projects as being positive externalities, benefits all of society through some public expenditure and sometimes private money. We've talked about health and well-being, um, drug development, research and technology and innovation, and public health generally all have positive externalities. And then we have public goods, goods that are not excludable and non-rival like public parks, um, open spaces, clean air and water that have positive benefits to all of society. So even though these things might not be priced well by the market, that's one of the things we want to think about is the role of the government in regulating, providing, and subsidizing these behaviors. So that's it. And that's kind of the big idea here. Whether we're talking about negative externalities or positive externalities, we're going to see a role for the government to intervene in these market failures and try and improve outcomes. With positive externalities, we want to see the government come in and subsidize, help lower the cost of this behavior so we can increase it, increase research and development, increase use of public health saving and improving programs, um, increase educational attainment, those kinds of things. Um, with public goods, we're going to see a role for the government to subsidize them further, maybe even fully providing them. And so whether we're talking about research, technology, food and drug safety, um, medical advancements, we're always going to see when these market failures emerge that there does tend to be a role for the government to step in and improve outcomes. Um, and so with positive externalities, we're going to see the government come in and try to increase production of that positive benefit good or service or behavior to try and create more of it. So that's it for today. Let me know what you think. Let me know what examples you'd like to see more of, and I will see you next time. Have a great day.